possibly a little bit about myself as a background. I actually uh, did my bachelor's degree at another university here in Oxford. I did a PhD at uh, Sheffield University. <laughs> Was that Sheffield or Oxford? <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> so the other way around, and I was actually asked, um, I was actually asked over lunch uh, a question about when I did my PhD or what was the thing to work out how old I was. But I'm not going to tell anybody except to say that it used to be Sheffield City Polytechnic and uh, Oxford Polytechnic when I was here in those two cities. But I did a PhD in semiconductor physics and then actually went over to work for IBM in Germany as a semiconductor engineer. Um, IBM closed down their plant and uh, they offered me a new job and uh, they said, would you like to retrain as a patent attorney? So I then ended up retraining as a patent attorney, spent five years working as a patent attorney within a commercial company, um, obviously doing the usual sort of things that patent attorneys can do. Uh, writing patterns and doing things like that. But one of the other things I did quite a lot of was that I, we did a lot of in-licensing, in-purchasing of um, intellectual property. And when I then moved a couple of years after that, about five years, to head up the IP business of W.L. Gore and Associates in uh, Europe, you probably know Gore because uh, it makes Gore-Tex products. And um, I was their European Patent Council for a number of years. We also did um, some of this. It was managing the intellectual property, looking at research and development contracts, um, also looking at how to bring collaborations together. Some of the experience that you'll hear today is based on that work that I did, not all of it, since I've done a number of other projects over the years. Um, I've got some slides here which contain some names. This is all publicly available information here. Um, just excuse me if I don't mention the names of the particular collaborations that we were working with because some of it is confidential. Some of it I can tell you offline um, if anybody needs some more information about it. So, what we're going to talk about this afternoon is we had um, Eugene this morning talking to us very much along the lines of how you manage it, what is the value of technology, how to think about who can actually benefit from the technology concerns. What we're going to talk about today is the other side, the big companies, the SMEs, who is actually your potential collaboration partners here. How do they do it? The majority of you here are actually from academics or research institutions. There's a few SMEs I spotted around about the place. So I'm going to really address it to those sort of peoples, uh, people who've done that in the technology transfer role or are academics interested in working out how to transfer their technology. And all of these case studies are actually based on FP7 work and sometimes FP6 work. So the Horizon 2020, as we've heard earlier this morning and yesterday afternoon, is slightly different, much more favourable to the transfer of technology to exclusivity rights. And so most of it will apply. There will be some differences. To talk about both big companies, small and medium-sized enterprise, and then a little bit about consortium research. Now, I know I'm scheduled for two hours, and you're supposed to have a half an hour break in between. Uh, just a vote. Would you prefer me to speak for one and a half hours so that you can then piss off straight away, or would you want me to speak for the whole two hours and we'll have the coffee break? Uh, does anyone want me for two hours? No. <laughs> so let's, no, seriously, we'll, we'll try, we'll do this in about one and a half hours. Feel free to bring in, interrupt me, or give some of your experiences. But the first thing I want to talk to is, how many of you have actually tried to license in your IP into a big company? Okay, one, two, three. Successful? Yeah, successful? No, yeah. <laughs> no. So we've got all of that. How many of you have heard stories about big company licensing in and then never using the technology? I've certainly heard that. And there's actually some quite well documented case studies about that. Why people have done that? Well, this why big company doesn't exploit the technology, sometimes we don't know. There's a book that was published in German a couple of years ago um, accusing Bayer of actually taking in some technology and never exploiting it. Um, I do, you don't know the tr what's the other side of the story. But one of the things you've got to remember, and that's what Eugene emphasised this morning, is that a lot of the work that's coming out of universities is not ripe for commercial exploitation to start off with. 
a big company has got two things that it's got to cope with. Firstly, it's got to bring that technology up into a commercialization phase, which requires substantial research and development expenditure, in addition to what you might have done in the university. And the second thing, it's got to be adapted to the product portfolio that you're involved in. If it doesn't match into that product portfolio, or can't be adapted to match into that product portfolio, it's never going to be a success at all. And what we're going to talk about today is a lot of it's going to be patents based. But I really need to emphasize something that Eugene said to us earlier on today. It's not just about filing patents. It's not just about licensing out patents. It's all about what the whole sort of package is, everything together. Um, it's all about working out how you can productively contribute your technology to the other person concerned. The other thing I'd like to emphasize about, we heard a little bit about patenting costs again this morning, you know, how to forecast it, can you do it, can you introduce it, are those costs part of the Horizon 2020 project? Well, the answer is quite clearly yes. Can you forecast those costs? Yes, you can do quite a lot of good forecasting about those costs. How many patents should you file? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I mentioned over lunch to, to you, I think it was, <coughs> we had, there's a statistic that was produced a couple of, no, about 10 years ago now, looking at how many patents the member companies of the S&P 500 index in the United States had. Um, of the innovative companies. It was interesting, <laughs> for every roughly $1 million of research and development expenditure, the big companies seem to file an average of one patent for that $1 million of R&D expenditure. Just to give you a little bit of statistic, what people, you know, what the big companies are doing. Probably, I would say that anybody who's doing a seriously interesting technology potential for technology transfer, we're probably looking at filing more patents per research and uh, for, for their budget. And the reason for that is if you're doing a licensing out, the more patents you have, the more relevant patents you have, the stronger your license will be. I haven't talked much about license contracts, but there's a lot of rules and regulations that need to be taken into account, which we can talk about later on. And generally, the more patents that you have in those, the easier it is to do. Now, the other thing is, don't file a patent unless you've got a reason for filing the patent. If you don't have a business reason for filing it, don't file it. It may be brilliant technology that you have. It may be absolutely you know, might get a paper front page of nature or science, you might get a massive impact rating, but lots of that technology can never be exploited. Why would you patent that technology if you can never exploit it? Just look at, there are companies that spend millions of dollars on R&D and never get any commercial benefit from it at all. When I worked for the European Patent Office, for example, I examined high temperature superconductors. I don't know if anybody, anybody working in high temperature superconductors here by any chance? No, okay. So I'll tell you a little bit about high temperature superconductors. IBM got, or some IBM researchers got a Nobel Prize for it, I think at about 1990, sometime around that. And it was obviously a major breakthrough. And people started really researching into it. People started filing lots and lots of patents. The number of examiners at the European Patent Office was increased within a few months from a person working half a day on high temperature superconductors to see people working, I think it was about five of us in total working on it, full time. How many people see commercial high, high temperature superconductor products these days? Anybody got any guess how many there are around the place? Sorry? Well, there's one more, I think, than one, <laughs> actually. Uh, there's only, uh, there's a handful. The whole thing we were talking about, superconducting computers, which were going to be really fast, never came into it. A whole load of patents about it. The whole thing about um, uh, using it for a whole lot of uses. 
There are some specialized uses in magnet magnetics, for example, magnetic fields, generation of magnetic fields where you have very high currents. Um, and there's also some for power generation. But it's only really now, or at least in the past few years, 30 years after that major breakthrough by IBM, that it is becoming commercially interesting. When I worked at the EPO, we were getting hundreds of patents pouring in with high temperature superconductors from research units, from companies, from IBM as well. But we filed them, we examined them, there was lots of crossover, we came to lots of conclusions. Um, I left the EPO before some of, the, uh, some of that work really got going. But what I'm saying to you here, there was no business behind it at all. People were actually spending a lot of money filing patents without much business, but, but uh, no potential business there. So if you don't actually know what your business is going to be, you probably should never think about filing it. But on the other hand, I mean, it's often that you have a piece of technology <coughs> and you do not know its usefulness. It's, it could be something that <coughs> appears in half a year, in two years or something. But suddenly you say, wow, this is, this is a use for my technology. Yes. I mean, that's always the thing. <laughs> Yeah. So, I, I mean, if it's a promising piece of technology as such, there could be a case for doing it anyway. There could be a case for doing it anyway, and certainly there is a case for doing it anyway, but people, I think people went massively over the top on that, including uh, universities. There were lots of universities filing on it, and then you have to... But there was no real business at the end of the day. The interesting thing was, if you read a lot of these patents, they will tell you in the introduction to the description why there is no business because you can't do certain things with it. The whole of the high temperature superconducting breaks down um, the moment you start putting large currents through it, uh, the, the ceramic materials. Now there are ways and means of overcoming that, but no, when I worked there, we had, they hadn't come out with that, or there was one or two that, interesting ideas there. Sorry, sorry can I? Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing I noticed here is that once a company like IBM leads it, Yes. It's very natural that others would follow. Yes. Okay. And, and, and that's kind of, I think uh, in this case, that could be one of the reasons why so many patterns came about. It's yes. Like, I hear you reading it, it's one of the, well, the number yeah. of um, and the, the, the point, you're quite absolutely right. I mean, IBM led, so lots of companies followed and lots of research institutes followed. And there were programs in the UK, emergency programs introduced to, 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 to do it, is my recollection. At the end of the day, so many patterns were filed, they were all going to be interlocking with each other. Um, but nobody really knew what the business was going to be out, out of it. If you don't really understand what your business is going to be, it's fine doing R&D. I'm not saying you shouldn't be doing R&D, but you should really be seriously thinking about what the commercialization strategy should be. And you shouldn't just be, I don't think you should, to be very careful about filing a large number of patents on the hope that something might come out of it, particularly when lots of other people are also filing patents, um, because you are not going to get that degree of uniqueness which means you are not going to be able to develop a successful co commercialization strategy unless you've got that one really fundamental patent out there. The people who came up with the particular combination of barium copper, B, uh, B, I've forgotten what the other end, B, anyway, barium copper oxides, who came up with the particular formulation which turns out to be useful, probably had a really good patent but most of the other people really don't have much, didn't have that much value out of their IP findings there. Would they not be speculative in terms of creating a freedom to operate position? Yes, but there's much cheaper of ways of creating a freedom to operate position than filing a patent application, um, which uh, there's ways of doing it where we can actually go out, you can actually just publish it, just put white papers up on the internet, Create your freedom of operate, uh, freedom to position. There's also something called research disclosure, which is a journal which is distributed to every single patent office around the world, I believe, plus all of the major copyright libraries, saying anonymously saying certain ideas. When I worked for IBM, they had something called the technical disclosure bulletin, and that technical disclosure bulletin had ideas which IBM rejected as being patent worthy but wanted to create prior art. And that was also given to the major patent offices. So one of the companies, big companies, who's got a very publicized innovation system looking out there to collect ideas from research institutes, from universities, is 
Procter & Gamble. I've never worked for Procter & Gamble. All of my information that's come up here is actually from the internet. So if anybody has any insights, please feel free to say it. What they are doing is they're they've got this formal submission process. They're not the only company that's got this formal submission process. You can go to their website, uh, go to Connect and Develop, submit the ideas you think are of interest to Procter & Gamble, and they will review those ideas. Most other big companies, even if they don't have that formal system, will accept ideas on the spec. But you have to remember, most big companies have multiple research groups, which means that if you submit your idea, let's say to uh, BASF, and you send it to somebody in Ludwigshafen, you may never be 100% certain it actually gets to the right person in the company. When I worked for IBM, we used to get multiple submissions coming into the German office where I worked, and we used to try and identify the right research group to evaluate the, uh, the idea. Sometimes it didn't work. When I worked for, um, uh, when I worked for Gore, I can remember um, hearing about a submission idea. I'd never seen it, but somebody had fortunately heard about it. Again, it'd been submitted to the wrong group. Many big companies, they're just so large, it can be really, really difficult to identify the right person to be in it. If you have an individual name, if you see somebody who's on other patent applications, Eugene talked yesterday about patent searching, it can be extremely valuable just to identify inventor names, who is actually working on a particular technology, and to try and uh, get hold of him or her. Um, Believe it or not, I've used LinkedIn these days as a massively good tool to try and get into the right people in the right companies for various projects. That works quite well. Um, people tend to respond to it, I, if my experience. Uh, often they'll respond saying, I'm not the right person, but go to Mr. X, Mrs. Y, doctor, professor, something like that. But it does get there. My experience of just sending blind submissions to big companies is that you might get a standard letter coming back to you saying, we're going to investigate this, and then maybe a few weeks later, you will get a response um, which says, thank you, but no thank you. Now, don't make the assumption if you get the response and then suddenly you find that they're working on the same sort of thing as several people have done over the years. With these multiple um, groups going on, it can be very well the case that one part of the company is working on the project that you're similar to what you're working on. You submitted it to another party. They know nothing about the other part of the research group. They know nothing about it and things uh, really don't get connected. Procter & Gamble also have technology scouts who are going out there looking, finding, trying to resource information from people. If anybody's got anything inter for, to, for interest of Procter & Gamble, it's worthwhile at least inviting one of those technology scouts to come and visit you at some stage if, you have, if they haven't been to do, see you in the past. And several other companies have also got them out there um, who are doing it. They're often wandering around trade fairs um, particularly in Germany, some of the big German companies will always go around some of the big German trade fairs looking at what R&D groups are doing there. Um, those of you who are in the UK, for example, can get some support from the uh, Department of, uh, what's it called these days, business, um, to actually go and jo joint trade stands. There's always a large one, for example, at the Hanover Trade Fair at Biotechnica, one run by the UK. Uh, various UK organisations which some universities use. They are an excellent showcase and the technology scouts, at least from some of the German companies, are wandering around there looking at it, trying to work out what's going on. Um, we talked, somebody mentioned earlier on about the Cordis Research Database, which was there. Um, and we talked about yet2.com. Um, I can only repeat what somebody said this morning. If you are in a company, you really do not have the time to wade through these databases. It's not interesting to put that information up on the database. You will not get 
attraction from any of most companies. Occasionally somebody might pick it up, but my experience suggests that that is never particularly interesting at all that's out there. And certainly uh, there, is, there have in the past been so many of these databases, people are pushing them up. It comes up, maybe the idea comes up every five years. We'll put the patents up there um, and hopefully the, somebody will spot them. It really doesn't work at all. It really requires, if you want to get into a big company, working at it. Now, how does this idea submission process work in the big companies? Well, it's basically got, what's that, five steps at the end of the day. And this is obviously generalised. Um, you submit your idea, whether through a formal submission system, such as Procter & Gamble, or an informal one, by writing to the company, then you push it in there. Most companies do a very quick initial review. Certainly if it ends up in the patent group or the business development group, one of the first things they'll do, and look, have you got a patent on it? And a lot of companies more or less say, if there's no patent on it, we will not look at it any further. And people say, well, why? Why would you look at any further? It's to protect you, and it's to protect the company. It doesn't necessarily have to be a granted patent. A patent application is fine. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, uh, a pending application, uh, sorry, a published application. If it's just pending, at least you can say it's pending in the submission. They may ask you to forward the text. That's quite common of the pending submission. We'll come to that in a moment. But the companies want to know what you've actually patented. They want to have proof that before you submitted this idea to the big company, it has already been filed somebody else so that there's independent evidence that the idea was in existence before it was submitted to the company. If you've not got a patent, many companies will send back that submission more or less unread and will say, file a patent. You come back and say, we don't have money to file a patent, well, hard luck. Most, many companies will not look at that idea in any detail. Some will, but most companies will do it. The other thing about it is that you'll find, as I've mentioned before, multiple research groups working on multiple ideas. It may well be that a big company has somebody working on a very, very similar product. Metallurgy companies working on similar alloys or pharmaceutical companies working on similar pharmaceuticals, which you don't know about because it's all in-house, nobody's published because it's a company, they're keeping everything commercially secret. They've not, the patents have not been published, maybe there's no patents yet to be filed. Um, they want to be able to say, we told you that we're not going to have this without evidence that you were the first person at what date you created it. Now, Assuming you've got through that initial review, sometimes it'll include you know, uh, questions about more details. They'll probably want to know who the people involved are. They may actually want to know a little bit, have you done any background due diligence, etc. It then often goes into a three-step step review. I mean, I've done these linearly, but more often what will happen is this will be done all at the same stage. Technical review, is it going to work? Some of the people in these companies are going to be extremely good technologists. They will have a better understanding of whether it's actually going to work, this invention that you've suggested or this idea that you've suggested. They will also understand whether it can actually fit into their ecosystem. So, for example, what is IBM looking for? Well, IBM's got so many products out there, but there are things that it's not looking for. It's not looking, for example, for application software. So there's no point in having, a, as far as I'm aware, they're not looking for it anyway. It was, uh, it's no point in saying, I've got a fantastic app for the iPhone. Wouldn't you like it, IBM? Well, the answer is probably, no, I wouldn't like it, because IBM's not into that marketplace. There are other people who are doing that sort of thing. And if, you submit, if you've submitted your idea to the wrong company, well, IBM's certainly not going to do it. They might, they're unlikely to even say who to submit it to, but there are these app aggregators. If, for example, you submit your new pharma, uh, pharmacological drug to a company which mostly basic um, product portfolio is on skin care and it has nothing to do with skin cancer, 
you can forget it's certainly not going to be of interest for them. And I say that, it may sound very strange, but you think that's a software company, they must be interested in my app. That's a biotech company, they must be interested in my idea. It doesn't really work about that. The technical review will sit there and will probably say, no, it's not going to work in our ecosystem. It doesn't necessarily mean it will never work in anybody's ecosystem. It just won't work in our ecosystem. Don't take the idea on board. And you might ask for feedback. Sometimes you might get feedback. In many cases, you won't get feedback because people don't want, the companies don't want to go lean out and say, OK, give it to company X, um, simply because they don't necessarily know what's going on in company X. A legal review. Do you want to tell your story? Are you allowed to tell your story? Okay. Uh, yes, if you can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a situation where uh, one of our research groups had developed uh, some technology which had been developed in the Framework 6 project. And uh, when that finished, uh, a certain company that happens to manufacture jet engines not very far away from Derby uh, became interested in it. But before they would take a step further, they insisted on us getting an independent legal review to say that we absolutely had the right to own the technology and to license it, and it had to be done independently. So we had to quickly commission uh, a part, an IP partner of a major legal firm to do the review for us, which, which the, the annoying thing was it cost a fair bit of money, but it was an answer which we could have given to them, but they wanted it to be done independently. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly sort of what will go on in that legal review you may well get that question put back to you. And certainly within Horizon 2020 project, that is going to be, I think, one of the issues. Can you actually license this technology that's developed within the Horizon 2020? And if you've not addressed that issue to start off with, it's going to be a, a real issue. Who are the inventors? How did they acquire the right to this? Now, we heard from Alistair this morning that Brooks has this policy that everything belonging to, sorry, everything from an employee of Brooks, whether they're self-financed or not, to take the point from that gentleman there, belongs to Brooks. I believe Cambridge, is anyone from Cambridge here by any chance? I believe Cambridge has a totally different policy in the other direction. Um, and it depends on university to university. Sorry, I think I saw somebody from Karolinska here. Is anyone from Karolinska? No, from Sweden, are you? No, nobody from Sweden here. Okay, they've gone. They've gone. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, right. Um, so, so, so for, I believe in Sweden, for example, a lot of it belongs to the research institutes. Germany, it now belongs to research institutes, but um, it, Italy, I believe, the IP is held by the individual professors. Is that correct? You know, we've got this tremendous mix of people, and you've got a, you've got some data sheets, haven't you, on that on the IPR world? Yeah, we have. Yeah. yeah, it's you know, so some of it is actually going to become incredibly messy within this um, Horizon 2020 if you've not started addressing those interests, uh, those issues, and try and commercialise the technology you may well find you trip up at that legal review. And I can tell you something. Try and find a PH student who worked on the project five years ago, who's left the university, probably got one through one or two postdoc positions. That can be challenging, to put it mildly, particularly if you need his signature on some documentation to transfer the ownership rights across to whoever's trying to do the business. Uh, the legal review will also often include a freedom to operate review. Now, one of the things you have to remember is that big companies have this whole, or most of them, have this whole web of license agreements between the individual, between themselves and other companies. So, even if you know of a patent that is held, a blocking patent that is held by another company, it doesn't necessarily mean that your idea would be rejected. Why? Because of these interacting agreements, these cross-license agreements between the different companies. Just to take an example, how many people here have got an iPhone? OK, about half, third. How, sorry? <laughs> how many people have got a Samsung Galaxy or what have you? So about the same number. 
I don't know who everybody else has got, so they've probably still got Nokias or something like that. <laughs> who's, who's got a Nokia? Anyone still got a Nokia? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any dinosaurs in the room? Um, the interesting question is, I mean, we've all heard about the Apple against Samsung, you know, big bang up, uh, big debate. What's it all about? It's all about money and how much you pay in licensing. But the interesting thing is, how is it that his Nokia, Nokia have got some of the most fundamental patents on the GSM telephone system, works with Apple and works with Samsung? It's because they've all negotiated, with the exception of Apple and Samsung, Nokia against, with Apple, Samsung with Nokia, Ericsson, and uh, the Siemens have still got, no, Siemens have still got some patents out there that are relevant, and lots of companies have all negotiated these cross-license agreements. So in the telecommunications space, there's no blocking patents. The same thing has happened in computer technology. IBM are fairly open about that. You can license most of their technology, get access to the IBM patents. You have to pay them for it, but you can get access to it, which means that the freedom to operate is totally different context than within the, your uh, small companies. Because even if there are blocking patents out there, there may not be a problem. But often companies, before they start investing in developing, commercializing your technology, will actually do their own freedom to operate. And they probably won't spend 5,000 because that's possibly too cheap for them. They may well spend 50 to 100,000, depending on the technology, to find out whether there really are blocking patents out there. They won't just necessarily rely on a statement that you made. A lot of them won't rely on that statement. A lot of them will get inde commission independent reports because they want to have security that they can actually commercialize this technology. And finally, the business review. Can I make a business out of it? Mentioned earlier on with high temperature superconductors, nobody has, possibly one company now, has really made a business out of high temperature superconductors. Certainly not what we thought it was going to be. Companies really want to understand, can I make money out of it? That means, do I get a significant return on the money? And if you can actually help them understand where they can get their return on their investments, help them actually understand what the issue is, how they're going to make the money, where it all fits into their ecosystem, you will find that they're much, much more open to these idea submissions. Going through all of that again, that is actually a tremendous burden that is put onto it, which means that many ideas are actually rejected very much at this initial review. Because they're not compatible with current technology, they're not all complementary to existing technology, and potentially they cannot make, create a new business model. Now, very so often something comes along, it was the iPhone with Apple, created the whole of our smartphone um, uh, system um, that created something different. If you can address that in your initial review, you'll often get over it, or the initial submission, you'll often get over it, um, and then get right through to actually understanding what the legal position is. They really want to know what patents you've got out there. Copyrights, if you've got any software out there, tell them about the software that you've got. By the way, somebody addressed open source software here. Really quite important. One of the issues we've had a couple of times recently is actually understanding what open source software has been included in your software program. And you'll be surprised, particularly if you've got grad students working on anything like that, how much gets infected into you. It's not a no-brainer. You can license open source software, but you actually have to understand what you've got in there. There are some open source licensing codes, uh, so licenses, which are almost totally incompatible with commercialization of the software, I'm afraid. If you've got those in there, then you've got a problem. You have to rewrite that, those modules. Many of the ones that are used commercially these days, the, uh, and, uh, I've got a whole list of them which are compatible with commercialization. That's fine. If you've got those, don't worry about it. There are companies that will actually review your code to make certain which licenses, what code is available out there to do it. Some companies won't take open source soft software at all. 
If you say it's already open source, they'll say, well, why, can I, why are you trying to sell it to me? I can just pick it up and down off the internet. You have to have much more of a value to them and suggest you've got a value to them than just uh, trying to submit open source software to them. Um, they'll often look at um, the, uh, whether you've got patents or pat granted patents out there, as I said. We talked about third party IP. The other very valuable thing is know-how or what you sometimes call show-how, show them how to do it. Have you got know-how there? Are your inventors prepared to actually sit down with the potential commercialization partner and show them how to do it? Again, it's Eugene that talked about it this morning about whether the inventor is still available. If he or she is still available, tell them that he or she is available. Tell them that there are consultancy possibilities open to them for the simple reason that the, my experience shows that the best and valuable commercialization comes not just with this package of IP rights, patents granted and what have you, but it actually comes with people, people who are prepared to do it, grad students who are looking for jobs after they graduate and prepared to go, want to go and work here. This comes with um, uh, professors who are prepared and interested to actually spend some time or train up some of the researchers in there. If those are available, tell the person you're submitting the idea, these people are available. You don't have to provide them free of charge. You can set up a consultancy agreement or you could lose, get, try and get more third party money research uh, into your um, organization. Um, if you're just trying to sell a package of rights, forget it. Um, I was at Bielefeld University, Some, somebody, was, somebody else knows Bielefeld University around here. You know Bielefeld, don't you? Um, so it's, Bielefeld is in the middle of Germany. The university is horrible. It really is. It's worse than this university. <laughs> sorry, I'm not... I'm sorry, I didn't mean the, the old buildings here, sorry. <laughs> that was a bit of... It's worse than the old building. The buildings there are, are worse than the old buildings here, but not as nice as these beautiful buildings here. So I have to correct that one. Um, and he was telling me about how he had a politician coming who was in the um, North Rest Wine, North Rest, North Rhine Westphalia Ministry of Higher Education, who'd been apparently to Stanford University a few weeks before and heard about this wonderful portfolio of patents that Stanford had and this amazing amount of money that they got in. I mean, some of some of you may know Stanford gave the uh, Larry, the price, Larry Page and um, what's the other guy, uh, the Google search patent, invested it into Google and eventually sold their share in Google for I think it was a 600 million US dollars or something like that. So that's massive return on investment. So he said, well, why can't we do this at Bielefeld University? And well, every, I would say that Trying to sell just naked patents, filing patents, getting them in place, just really doesn't work. I think people who've tried that model over the years have really not been successful. It's got to be this complete package with the people attached to it. And if you can put it in there, get it, um, get it there. Look, go back to inventorship or authorship. These slides are going to be available, so I've got, I'm going to address them. We talked about it. Make certain you know who your inventors are or your authors of your thing are. Going back to technology review, is it feasible? Can you understand it? Um, whatever you do, you don't have, with your initial submission, you don't necessarily have to put everything in place. You almost certainly cannot have an NDA in place for your initial submission. Very few companies are prepared to, prepared to take confidential information in and sign an agreement. And in no case, this happened to me several times, should you provide the confidential information, provide an NDA agreement with the initial stuff and ask for it to be sent back because you'll get the whole package sent back without the NDA agreement being signed. And who has, your, it's your fault, you've given them the information. The initial um, uh, submission should probably just be a taster, trying to explain what it is, why it is interesting, and offering to tell them a little bit more about it. At some stage, you will get the opportunity to sign an NDA, almost certainly, but in many companies, they will not sign an NDA whilst they're doing this evaluation. Whether you like it or not, you have to accept that. Why do they do it? 
because they are often working on similar projects and they want to make certain that they're not bound by any agreements with you that it could affect commercialization. Um, understand, so we talk about the IP position and we need to find whether we've got appropriate reviewers who've been looking at it. The business review, can we really make a business out of what's going on? Very, very important for most companies. What is the cost of implementation? What is the cost of actually bringing your technology into their ecosystem? That can be quite significant and is often underestimated by people who are outside of the company. Um, one of the other interesting things we, we comes about, we often hear these days about how important open innovation is. Yes, it is very important, and Eugene talked a little bit about it. It doesn't mean you should not file any IP rights. It does not mean you cannot file patents. What it means is that you are prepared to share your ideas. You are prepared, if necessary, to give a, a free license out on your patents. But the people who work best with this open innovation model, particularly the big companies who are starting to work with it, they'll often back up their right to use patents. P&G use it. There are other companies, who've, IBM, have given a lot of software patents out there, a lot of software technology free of use. It's often coupled with the requirement, you can use our patents free of charge, but only if we can use your patents, your technology, free of charge back to us. Um, that is often a very, very important thing to be bear in mind when you're doing it. If you've got an open innovation policy, if you're saying it's open innovation, it can still be very, very valuable to file the patents um, simply because it's a quid for pro quo. Now, there were some companies in the 1990s who basically said, well, we are not going to file patents because we want, you know, a, it's too expensive, we're going to give our ideas away. Well, we didn't want to give our ideas away, but we don't see the need for filing patents. I got involved in a little case about 10 years ago where a German company had actually, basically was practicing an open innovation model, giving out its ideas, and he came back and said, you know, well, we've got a bit of a problem. They were sued for patent infringement by another company. Not only had the other company sued them for patent infringement, the patent had actually acknowledged the people who came to have a little chat to me, had said company X GmbH who was already doing this when they filed the patent, and the company in Germany, we'll call it company X, um, company X said, but this is unfair because this is our technology. We told them about it or we told the world about it. We're commercialising it, we're doing a good business, and they've now come to sue us. And I said, yes, so what? They can sue you. They got the patent for it. But this is our basic technology. We have the right to use this. I said, yes, you have the right to use this technology, but they've got the right to use their patented technology. So the guy said to the managing director, said to me, but shouldn't they pay us for using our technology? Because we're the, the inventors. And I said, yes, if you've got a patent for doing it, they could have paid you patent. We could have got a rather nicely negotiated agreement both sides would, could use the patent rights, both sides openly without paying any fees or anything like that. But because you failed to file that patent in an appropriate time, the other company, the patent holding company, was in a much, much better position and was actually able to get fairly significant damages from the other company, from the first company, just call it X. Um, and Nigel did say he was had to go earlier on. <laughs> um, uh, and so we, what we actually said, and so they, we, they ended up in this, the rather unfortunate situation that they actually ended up paying for what they considered to be their own, for the use of their own technology, despite the fact that they'd had an open, what they could consider, or what we'd now call an open innovation model. Again, the same sort of thing is, you know, if you're talking about exploiting your Horizon 2020 um, project results in an open innovation model, actually think about whether you might still need to file patents, at least in a commercial sense. Um, there's actually an issue. Somebody was talking about um, you know, giving, giving away your results. If you look at the Horizon 20, was it you who was talking about? Uh, no, 
sorry, uh, this morning. Somebody, anyway, maybe it was over lunch. And they said, well, what we could do is we publish and it becomes free of charge for everybody to use. There's actually an issue about that because if you give the results to, to a non-EU country that's not participating in the Horizon 2020, you're supposed to actually get permission, at least from the project manager at the European Commission, that he or she... Sign the rights to it. It's, so it's assigned the rights. Going, this is, this right. That's okay. So that's the dis yeah. Just be a little bit careful about sort of you know understanding that. We don't know how the Commission is going to treat this. I mean, they've put so much emphasis nowadays on commercialisation, and you know, the, 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 quite frankly, the the hope is at the end of the day, this is going to be commercialisation by European companies. They're going to treat very very cautiously if you want to si uh, sign out. I've worked within. Uh, two US companies, the European subsidiaries, and I know that there's been concern about using European technology. There's been concern about it. Um, certainly the same sort of issue has happened. We, when I worked for one company, we wanted to use some technology developed by Fraunhofer and uh, Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, and they actually had to go to the Ministry of um, Science or the Ministry of Economic Affairs to actually get permission to even start talking to US companies about this. Just something that you need to bear in mind about what's going on and your commercialization strategies. But as I said, thank you very much for the clarification about assigning. Probably with the licensing of technology out, it's not going to be too much of a position, but I would advise anybody doing that to make certain that their uh, project manager is well aware of what's going on in that context. Um, is there a Europoid uh, guideline um, dictating who owns a project? Or is it up to the individual country, institution? <coughs> Sorry, uh, the guidelines to maintain? Uh, for example, uh, to, uh, so not to maintain, at least are there any European guidelines that, that could, uh, for example, our, in our university, uh, whoever works with the university, it doesn't matter, the, the IP will be owned by the university because the, the employees pay yeah. the university. Is there a guideline in the European framework that dictates? I don't think there is a guideline. We have, I think there's a, in one of our fact sheets, <coughs> we simply have an overview about the different procedures in the different countries. But there is no guidance given from the European Commission. I mean, there is a, there's a recommendation, there's a EC recommendation how to, about IP policies in higher education institutions in general. There is a something which you can find. It's an EC recommendation that you get access to it towards the annotated grant model on the participant model. So you go to the participant model, then you get access to the annotated grant model, and then the grant model is, there is a reference document. And this is the EC recommendation. And this is um, IP guidelines for higher education institutions in Europe. Yeah. So it's not on country level, but it's for higher education institutions in general. Yeah. There is such a recommendation. Yeah. It's an official EC document. Yeah. So there's, so um, the two, two points about it. It depends, firstly, on country to country. And secondly, within the countries, on university to university, I'm afraid. And there's a fact sheet on the IPR help desk websites, which gives you an overview of the legal obligations within the various countries, if my recollection is correct. Um, plus, we've got this fact sheet, but there's no simple answer. There was an attempt a couple of years ago where the European Commission looked at it, not in the context of Horizon 2020, but in the context of, um, of um, general harmonization of European law. But it is such a thorny subject in different countries that it becomes very, very difficult to tackle because you have to marry up the German employee remuneration, which can be significant. For university lecturers, it's very, very significant. They get 30% of proceeds coming into the university. With the UK system, which basically says, well, we heard in Brooks says um, you have to transfer across. In most commercial companies, your work contract of employment says you transfer all IP across to the company, your employing company, without any compensation. You might, if it's a very, very important invention in the UK, be able to get extra compensation, but it's a very, very special case that comes up. And just a smart comment, because the issue was raised, if you're within Horizon 2020, uh, transfer knowledge to a country outside Europe, particularly to industrialized countries outside Europe, of course, you can do it whenever you want in, in the form of non-exclusive licenses. Mm. But when it comes to exclusive licenses or when it comes to assignments, then you have to, to ask for permission. And that's going to last until four years 
after the completion of the brochure. Yeah. It's quite, quite important. I'm going to talk about SMEs and understanding what's going on in SMEs. Has there anybody got any questions about how to work with big companies or any comments that they want to make about that? Then we'll just move on to SMEs, to understanding what's going on. This is, again, based, in fact, a lot of work I'm doing at present. And this was um, it, Nokia I've just put there, there, because it's a telephone from Nokia. It don't, uh, it's not to, it's meant to imply that you're actually working with Nokia. And one of the interesting things that um, this is a case that um, I worked on um, some years ago. And one of the interesting things was the development of a new sealant material. One of the issues that you've got about um, telephones, of course, I mean, we've all had the problem that the you know, rain has leaked into our telephone. Um, because it, um, I've certainly had that problem if you dropped it in the bath or in the toilet system or something like that over the years. You know, it doesn't, sometimes doesn't work. So what you really want to do is you need to seal it. The issue about sealing it is that you often then have, a, you have a metal case with a, a sealant, a rubber seal, well, use plastic sealant around it, and that leaks radiation, which is something you don't necessarily want to happen. So what, we, what the company that I was um, doing some work with here was um, did, they developed basically a electromagnetic seal which sealed against moisture and also sealed against radiation. And the interesting question about that was how did we actually do it? There were different research, there were different interests, and think about this, how these are going on. So this was a, it wasn't actually within an EP, a, a European context at all, but it could equally have been a, a context. If you think about it, the manufacturer in this example, Nokia, but it wasn't Nokia, um, they had, their intellectual property was obviously in the product design, how it looks like. They knew what the market is, yes, the knowledge of the market is also intellectual property, if you think about it. These are really important ideas. It's one of the reasons why you're trying to license your technology out, because it's going to the market. They knew there was a need for this technology. They really knew that this was a problem. Um, they had some electronics technology with some patents, and they had some really skilled um, engineers out there who knew a lot about telecommunications. What they didn't know much about was actually how to create these sealed boxes. The Research Institute, um, they obviously had this electromagnetic sealing technology. They had been using it in other different contexts over the years. They had about five patents, I think they've got a few more since then, on this. They knew about what type of polymers were going to be really good for doing this. They knew how to make these polymers electromagnetically resistant. What they also knew is they understood about how to use it in products. They had quite a lot of know-how and quite a lot of skilled engineers here. So the interesting thing about that we had here was really to understand what actually was going to be the IP position that we really wanted to get out of this. <clears throat> now, if you think about it in Horizon 2020 context, the initial negotiation position by anybody, uh, the manufacturer, what they'd really like to have is all IP that is exclusive to the manufacturer. They don't want the other smartphone or telephone manufacturers to have this idea if possible. They basically want to have free license to all of the background technology that the Research Institute might have. They don't want to pay more than they have to. They're paying for the development of the electromagnetic seal. Um, and they know that the Research Institute is going to actually under, well, you know, use some of their background knowledge, what they've got in the past. And they also want to do everything confidential. That's what they'd like to have. And what would the Research Institute would like to have? Well, they'd like to have full payment for the work done. They'd like to have their 100,000 pounds, 100,000 euros for the product development to pay for a couple of engineers for a couple of months to develop it. And they know they can do it. They've done this similar sort of things in the past. Of course, the Research Institute would like to have lack, uh, no exclusivity. I've, I've developed this for, for Nokia in my example. I'd also like to be able to sell it to Apple or to Samsung or possibly to um, in games, game stations or something like that. Um, 
They need this freedom to develop products for other customers. And obviously, being a research institute, most of them are on part time, sorry, uh, uh, limited contracts, not part time contracts. Um, they'd like to have freedom to publish. The engineers really want to get their publication record up. That can be actually quite difficult to resolve, which is exactly what happened when we started off on this contract. You know, two diamet diametrically opposite positions here. One company, the manufacturer, says, I pay for everything, I want everything, and I want it exclusively. And the other one says, we've got all of the know-how you need to use us, we can't give it to you exclusive it, exclusively. Now, as we go through, what actually happens? We got to, in essence, what Horizon 2020, at least the model contracts, are doing these days. We've got background intellectual property to the research institute, no exclusivity. Absolutely no exclusivity, which is fine. Um, there was no payment or no particular payment for the use of that in this particular case, as you can negotiate in the High Rise in 2020. Um, but the manufacturer was allowed to use the background technology and the manufacturer um, was, able, was not able to sub-license it out, but was certainly able to um, use it and to ask his suppliers to use it. The foreground IP, we negotiated the following. Firstly, we negotiated exclusive use. That was fine. Had to pay extra on top of it. It wasn't, you know, the 100,000 euros for the development costs was just the start of what we actually had to pay. We probably should, I wasn't involved in it, but we probably should have negotiated something better at the beginning. But in the end, this is what went, happened. We also got transfer of ownership. Now, transfer of ownership, I think, is always one of the most difficult things within licensing technology. There are different rules in different universities around Europe on whether you can transfer your intellectual property. Many American universities cannot transfer their intellectual property to another company, um, certainly if it's publicly funded research. What they can do is they can give you exclusive rights to it. So we, what we did is we arranged for transfer of ownership, it was possible in this case. We also agreed with them that they could publish the results in a publicly available, in public journal, um, and also say that they'd done this work, who they'd done it for, but only after any patents had been filed. Again, it's in the Horizon 2020 model contract. I think it's a 45-day, and the model one is 45-day notice or something like that to allow patents to be filed, put in file, and it's possible to do it. Anybody who's using patent attorneys to say it can't be done needs to change their patent attorneys because 45 days is more than adequate to file a good patent out of it. What we also gave them we gave them the right to continue researching into this field using the knowledge that we've done. Now, actually, most countries in Europe have that right anyway, have the research right. You can continue to do research on stuff that you've done, even if it's patented by somebody else. The issue becomes you do not have the right to license this patent out unless you get this specific right. So the research institute here, could certainly continue researching on electromagnetic seals, but could not necessarily uh, license any other companies to use this without at least getting a back license to the patent. In this case, the manufacturer held the patent, was basically prepared to license it into the non-telecommunications business without any problems whatsoever, but uh, we said, I would never actually do it within the... Um, uh, with to any other telecommunications. Sorry. In terms of uh, collaborative um, Horizon 2020 project, then um, the right to continue research and their continued research, which actually, if they're then going to join my project, is background. Yes. And of course, if I if if partner two needs access to that background, mm -hmm. then. You, your, your research centre, in theory, should be should grant that free judge. Would they have to refer back and get permission from the company in order to be able to allow that access to other partners for research and potential commercialisation uh, in a Horizon 2020? Um, the answer is, in most EU countries, if not all EU countries, they don't need it because you can use patented work for research and development 
sorry, for research purposes only, not for development purposes, for research. It's research and innovation. Yeah. So at which point does my, re my university research become innovation in Horizon 2020? Um, an interesting question, probably fact, depends on the particular facts concerned. Fact, just never ask yeah. it again and hope nobody notices it. Is, is, I, I was going to say, there's a, I was actually going to make exactly the same point. It's a practical point. I mean, you know, it really is. Actually, actually, one of the interesting things. I mean, I guess the majority, of, you know, a good half of us here are, heart, you know, scientists at heart, and so and most of you have got so, some sort of knowledge of science or practicalities. One of the issues I've found over the years, if I'm absolutely honest with you, is university. Anybody a university lawyer here, by the way? Sorry, I'm just about to. <laughs> <laughs> There are some university lawyers who probably don't include the people here who can actually get very, very legal about some of what's going on here. The practicality is it's going to, you're going to collaborate anyway. Your, in, in, uh, your, your professors and your postdocs are going to collaborate anyway, so let's just treat it like that. It's when you get into the commercialization aspect. Because then it's not unencumbered, is it? No, that's it's not technical. When you start getting into that, that's... yeah. <laughs> That's when you start getting into what's the potential commercialization, then you actually need to start thinking about do I need to get a back license, a back to license to this pattern? Yes. But if we just take this, what I've talked about, this Nokia thing, I can tell you that Nokia, it's public knowledge, Nokia have got, license, have got cross licenses um, to almost every other telecommunication company in the world. There's still a few disputes going on, which means that actually, if you submitted this idea to Nokia in my big company scenario, the fact it was in, sorry, to Ericsson, uh, it's probably a bad thing, uh, Samsung, yeah, it doesn't matter. It probably doesn't matter. You know, be honest. You can even be honest saying it's encumbered by a patent to Nokia. Samsung will probably just say, oh, we've got license to, we've got that license. That's one of the things that you need, you know, practicalities here need to seriously think about this. And in the big company context, there is so much cross-licensing going on, a lot of which you will never, ever know about. You see frequently license, you know, public releases, uh, press releases coming up saying, you know, so-and-so has licensed this patent to so-and-so. That's just the tip of the iceberg. It's the massively tip of the iceberg. People talk about um, you know, pat these big patent infringement disputes, Apple against Samsung. Well, that is big because it's a lot of money involved in it. It's big because it's gone on for so long. But what do the statistics suggest? I think the statistics say 99% of all cases are resolved with licenses at the end of the day. Yeah. I'm not sure, but I think you, you touched one of the most tricky things when it comes to licensing in Horizon 2020, because you have to be always aware of the fact that exclusive licensing is quite, quite difficult because you have always to respect the access rights of your partners when you license something. You can only do a exclusive licensing if they waive their access rights in writing. So it's not just you can give an exclusive license to somebody of your knowledge, because still the other partners have access rights until one or two years after the completion of the project. And that's one of the big mistakes there. Yeah. So really you have to ask the partners to waive the access rights, and otherwise you cannot license any of your technology in an exclusive way to your partners. So there is, on the model contract, there's yeah. a 45 day uh, period where you have, to, you have to notify them, is my recollection? That's for publications, yeah. patents as well. And but anyway, the licensing, you always have to respect there are, yeah. automatically there are access rights of others. And, um, but at the end of the day, somebody said this morning, it's, it's going to be, you know, let's be honest with you, if you are trying to license out for money some H Horizon 2020 projects, you can probably not expect to have exclusive or just get the proceeds for yourself. You probably need to at least think about sharing out some of the revenue to other partners there. And that's what it's all going to be about. I mean, I think that at the end of the day, there are some issues about it. It's going to be difficult. You're going to have to resolve things. But the model contract is not bad in that respect. And it gives quite a lot of um, opportunities to go out. And then people who really want to... Um, you know, if you've got a dispute, there's this mediation um, opportunity through WIPO, which um, is well worthwhile thinking about before you, e probably even at a very early stage, before people, you know, positions become so hardened. The worst thing that happens, the worst thing I've seen happen in a university research is when two research groups who previously collaborated end up, well, the researchers threatening to sue each other and the university trying to uh, stop them from suing each other. But, uh, um, and... 
get, in, get, get the mediators involved in very, very quickly. Um, certainly, if it's um, in a Horizon 2020 issue, um, I believe that the project officers will be able to help facilitate any disputes that may be able to come up. Um, and I think it's worthwhile, as I say, getting an, independent, you know, getting an independent mediator. They're available over WIPO. They cost, I think it's about 1,500 euros per day, um, uh, which, I mean, is a lot of money. But on the other hand, you know, you may well be taught. If you're disputing for less than 1,500 euros, it's probably not worthwhile thinking about. But it's worthwhile actually thinking about getting those people in. So anybody got any more questions? Any other comments about their experience with talk with uh, licensing out to SMEs? Um, it can be worthwhile. If I'm actually honest with you, licensing to an SME can actually be a damn sight easier than licensing to a big. You know, somebody up there is sort of nodding to me here. Why? Because they're much more responsive. They actually understand what their market is. They will know probably much more quickly whether the thing can be of success. You may not get the licensing revenue that you would have done by going out to a big company, but the, your cost of doing that deal, the transaction cost, as the econom economists would call it, is going to be much, much lower. I mean, you know, it's probably something that many people in technology transfer offices can do by themselves, whereas if you get a big company involved in it, you then end up talking to DLA in L Sheffield or London, wherever it was, and, uh, you know, paying them sort of 5,000 just for reviewing a couple of contracts or something like that. And that's the big company sort of aspect. Think about it with the SMEs. Often, if they're at least if they're still family-owned or um, just a small group of shareholders, decisions can be done very quickly. Whereas big companies, it's a bit of a cover your ass mentality. You know, CYA as the Americans would call it. You know, you want to make certain that your ass is clean. You don't want to have anything sticky in the backside, which is going to cause problems to your future career at the end of the day within that company. So, consortium research, probably a little bit more interesting about um, what's going on with Horizon 2020. Um, there's probably, you've heard a lot about what's about this in the past couple of um, days, um, and I'm conscious about time, so I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about what we talk about consortium research and how it's best done. I say the model EU contract is very, very good. Um, the one point, if you're looking at the model contract, which you might think about, the place of litigation is supposed to be Brussels, Belgium, and it's supposed to be under Belgium law. Think about whether that's appropriate for what's going on. If you're just a UK company doing with uh, German universities, whether you really need to have Belgium involved in it is another matter. But, you know, that's, that's the one quick point about the model contract that we need to think about. But, sorry? You mean for side agreements? You, that you can't negotiate the, the law of the ground agreement? The, the law of the... Well, it can, you can in certain contexts. The consortium agreement. The consortium agreement. You, are you, so you're talking about contract and so you say... Okay. You mean the consortium agreement? The sort consortium sorry. agreement, yes. Beg That's why I was wondering what you Beg mean. Beg your pardon. Yes, yeah, sorry. The, the model consortium agreement says Belgian law and uh, Brussels. And that not necessarily, if you've not got a Belgian company involved, may not be the best option. If you can get out of it. Yeah, tried, we've tried that, and, and arguing the law of England and Wales when you're coordinating doesn't really go down terribly well with anybody apart from those in England and Wales. On, on the other hand, I can say also that there is a, uh, uh, there is a book that deals uh, with Belgian law from a consortium uh, agreement perspective very well. Uh, yes. Uh, so, what that is, is that an book? argument for Isn't having Belgian law. What's the name of the book? Uh, I can check that for you. Consortium agreements uh, from the Belgian law or something. I, I can oh, check right, that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, by uh, Samoy, S P M O Y, and some other people. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's quite interesting. The, the point about um, if you get into a dispute, unfortunately, Brussels is not the best place to do patent disputes. They're well known for taking 10 years to make any decisions. Stockholm is very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stockholm is quite good. And that's one of the reasons why I, I keep on going back saying, you know, to think about the WIPO, and it talks about WIPO arbitration. So, you know, Belgium law is probably acceptable, but, you know, if you, if it's going to be the default for many of the consortium agreements. I just put it into play. If you're a UK talking to a German, sometimes it's not the most appropriate. It's like I wouldn't want to sign under German law or French law. Yes. And, and at, <laughs> least, at least 
Belgian law for the last 20 years, in my opinion, has, has, has proven to be, you know, fairly kind of anemic in terms of, you know, not that bad for most, you know, for just about everybody. Yeah, I've got it a, seems a, a, a good another thing here is also that the uh, the grant agreements and also the desk mm -hmm. are pretty much modelled on, on Belgian law, and if you yeah. start meddling around there, it could be okay, but it could also not be okay. Yeah, it's, and of course, one of the, apart from those that were written under the law of Luxembourg, when ICT programmes in Luxembourg, yeah. not in Brussels, but it, that seemed to be no different either. We had, we have, um, I did, I did, I've done, I've had revisit, done the uh, agreement under German law without any, so it's no problem under German law, this particular agreement. It might be more difficult under UK law, which is or English law, which is slightly different. One last interruption. Uh, the title is Consortium Agreement Agreements for Research Projects, blah, 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 by Samoy uh, and Lambrecht. Consortium Agreements for Research Projects. Thank you. Is it a recent book or? Uh, 2011. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I, I hadn't heard of that one. That's good. It's really, really good. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. It's 83 pounds in English money. <laughs> 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 it's cheaper than a book. It's cheaper in Belgium. In Belgium, it's cheaper than this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel an infringement of copyright. Mine in Belgium. One of the things I uh, will, will help you actually before you get into the consortium agreement, is actually what is your background intellectual property? If you're really thinking about doing a licensing program out of what's coming on, you really, and it's all going to be about intellectual property, it's going to be really, really interesting to know what is actually your background IP, because that can actually be one of the most contentious things that's going on but, uh, later on. Did you do this in the framework of the consortium agreement or did you do it before the consortium agreement? Um, what did you actually bring to the table? I've had about two or three disputes over the years where this has been an issue. Was it done within the consortium agreement? Was it not done within the consortium agreement? Why did you file a patent three weeks after the consortium agreement was signed? Legally, it's probably part of the, uh, of the research cooperation. Probably, practically, it was actually done beforehand, so it's possibly background knowledge. We uh, think about it and actually document, if possible, what your background knowledge is, particularly if you haven't yet published it. It's probably even worthwhile getting that draft paper done and, well, uh, at least submitted possibly, possibly filing a patent before the signature goes on to the consortium agreement, just to evidence what you have actually done before you entered into it. Um, one of the things we've done a couple of times is actually gone through and questioned the individuals in, who are going to be involved in the research project and actually filed several patents out of it before the consortium agreement was filed, simply because we wanted to have those patents documented or patent applications documented as being pending patent applications on the date that the consortium agreement was filed and they were put into the usual, what's the IP register, I think it's called under the, uh, uh, the current model agreement. It was put in there and said, these is what are part of our background agreement. If you don't do that, if you don't get that IP register properly sorted out, you can easily have a problem at a later stage trying to argue what is background and what is foreground knowledge, I'm afraid. And that can actually cost you a tremendous amount of money. If you get it documented correctly, get that IP register in place that is expected, you will save yourself a lot of time with later harvesting, uh, but sorry, with later licensing agreements between the various companies. I can't emphasize, I think that's going to be a very, very crucial thing, particularly for universities who uh, want to make certain that they retain things, and for SMEs who are going to be in those companies doing that to make certain that they understand what their knowledge base is before they came into doing it. Oh, sorry, I didn't catch it because I mean you have the inclusion list and you have the exclusion list. Yes. <coughs> so in what in what situation is this 
last thing now uh, that you're describing in, in what situation is Ma it relevant? It becomes extremely relevant when you, for example, you're say, you've, you, let's say you file a patent three weeks after the consortium agreement is filed. Legally, it probably is part of, and it's related to the consortium work. Because it's filed after the agreement was signed, probably legally, it's part of foreground IP. Well, if, I mean, if you've brought background on an exclusive basis to Horizon 2020, but no, no academic with an, an, any right kind of mind would, would say, I'm bringing this background for the exclusive use of this project. No, you and wouldn't say that. Happened. No, you wouldn't say that. But you really need, what you really need to do, sorry, I may have under, misunderstood the question. Yeah. You need to document that that is background knowledge. That's the point. You need to actually tell it. You need to have it in there. Yeah, all you do now is you, you, you say what you're bringing to the project. Yes. There's no exclusion. It's yes. just only what you... And, and the, the, the default is that nothing else is included. So now... In, in the no, what I'm speaking of is, I mean, you, you list in, in attachment one, uh, I bring A, B, C, and D. Yes. Um, that is what the other partners can rely on, yep. my bringing. And then you exclude, you qualify item D as saying that's uh, yes. however below or something. That's right. And then you make draconic uh, exclusions as well, but anyway. Uh, so, but anyway, then your partners can't rely on more than ABCD being accessible to them. Yes. But if you've, and the point about it making is, if you're bringing, yes, they can't rely on that, but if you're going to bring background intellectual property into the consortium, you must make, if you're doing patents, you need to file them before they, the contract, the consortium enters into force. Because the moment it enters into force, legally, it's okay. going to become foreground intellectual property. So it's slightly different than your... I've understood what you meant by inclusive exclusivity. I really don't understand why, why does that become foreground. That, that, that's presupposing that, that the university of wherever is only operating within one, one project. Yes, but if you're... Well, it does not necessarily suppose that it's going to be operating in one project, but it does become foreground knowledge if, it is going to, if people are involved and writing patents involved in this research and the patent is filed afterwards, it will become part of the foreground. Even if it's already declared as background? No, no but that's the point. You've got to declare it as background. Yeah, but you don't, you don't have to patent it. No, you don't have to patent it. If, it's, if I go, you can use that. It doesn't matter whether it's patented or not. If you, as long as you can use it... Yes. It doesn't have to be patented, it has to be declared, you have to know that it's background. If you are going to patent it, you should patent it before the consortium agreement comes into force. If you don't, it could easily end up being part of the foreground intellectual property. Okay, but perhaps not three weeks, because it wouldn't better kick off meeting Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I mean, good point, three weeks, yeah. I mean, there's... Um, yeah, I mean, yep, the, nine months after. Yeah. That, actually, that's, a, that's probably, you know, six months. Six months, it's a very interesting question. Germans, by the way, under German law, talk about a six-month period. Anything filed by the inventor within the six-month period is thought to belong to his previous employer. And a similar sort of thing... That, sorry if I've uh, explained it incorrectly. Um, the point of what I'm trying to say is I d understand, identify what your intellectual background intellectual property is um, and be careful if you're going to file patents after the entry of the consortium agreement is to place. Yeah. You need to actually make it clear. And one of the things you may well actually put into it is into your inclusion or exclusion list. Um, you know, patent application XYZ is currently under preparation or something like that. That would be an extremely good way of doing it. But if you suddenly come along nine months later to take your example, and say, this pattern was actually based on the work that we did beforehand, you're going to have a bloody difficult time to actually you know, make it, particularly if it becomes a really important pattern later on. Sorry. So I have a very quick question about this. Does it mean that our current IP policy states that you're encouraged to kind of declare your IP, background IP up front, but we will allow you to declare the background IP as and when you bring it in? Is that legally wrong to say that? No, it's not legally wrong. It's absolutely right, because that you may well be doing this ongoing. You just amend the, yeah. the relevant annex to the consortium yeah. agreement. It's a so if you suddenly bring new, yeah. because it's a five-year project, yeah. you may have invented something new or actually um, you know, the, the project may need something yeah. different. But then you amend the, 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 the annex that yeah. says, ah, now partner three is also bringing... I mean, you could, you could, you could, certainly, you could certainly think of the, the point about out of a research group, you know, you've got two or three postdocs or doc, doctoral students sitting working there, and by, purely by chance, somebody in the, nec the, the, you know, the, the group next door 
comes up with something interesting which you may actually want to put, deliberately put in, so you can, then can nominate that and put it into it without, a, you know, without any problem. But you should probably say it's, this has not been done with Horizon 2020 funds to make it entirely clear and put the exclusions as you want to do it, if, if appropriate. Now, I can't tell all everything um, that's going to happen during the next five years. You cannot tell that everything in the next five years. The point that I'm, try, uh, that I'm trying to make here is not so much about um, you know, what time is the point of time. The point is actually understand what your background intellectual property is before you um, enter, sign that consortium agreement. Because, particularly if it becomes very important, particularly if you want to do licensing out of that and get some running in from it at a later stage, if you've not identified it, there's a risk that the other consortium partners can actually have a free license or an automatic right to license of this agreement because it will be considered to be foreground intellectual property. Is clear? Sorry, is that understand? Um, can, I, can I ask you just one more question? I mean, would all these rights stay the same if uh, the agreement actually does not come uh, or is, has not been approved if the project or proposal has not been approved by the European Commission? Would all the rights uh, or agreed rights stay the same or would they be cancelled? Um, there will be no rights created from the agreement until it is approved and signed by all of the parties. Even though the project has not been sponsored by the European Commission? Um, if it's not sponsored... Yeah, if in retrospect, no. I mean, it then depends. I mean, I've got a couple of projects that I'm working on for a couple of people, which is using the model agreement, but the money's not coming from the European Commission. It's coming from another source, for example. And so, but the consortium agreement is signed. Once it's signed, it's put in place, it's in power. Legally. It's legally in power. And it happens to say more or less the same things that the model agreement actually says um, there. Now, the EU, the approval of the EU Commission, um, obviously, if the money is one thing, and whether it's a good project is another thing. They, if you use the model agreement with your, um, and select one of the alternatives, they're going to approve that contract without any problems at all. That's the whole purpose. Sorry, so you're, you're, you're confusing. So, so you're talking about what contract? There is no contract. It's a consortium so agreement. It's a contract. That, yeah. Well, yeah. we have grant agreement. We don't. You have grant agreements, and you have consortium agreements. So I, I wasn't sure what this is. I was just. I found that the most confusing conversation yeah, I, ever. I, I find it quite confusing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so are you yeah. saying? So you wouldn't have a consortium agreement no. without the signature of a grant agreement. Those two go together for Horizon 2020. Right. So if you and I may agree the terms upon which we'll sign a consortium agreement, right. but if the Commission don't give us the project. Yeah. We never sign it. Yeah, right. It's so gone. it's all good. Yeah. yeah. It's only effective if the grant agreement has been yeah. signed. Yes. Otherwise, the consortium agreement is a model. Yeah. It's, it's not a thing. Yeah. The, cons and the, the, the consortium agreement is force. always directly aligned linked to the grant agreement right. number from the. So yeah. they, they all and it's oh, so it's only for yeah. that specific set of tasks that we've agreed as a consortium. It has no bearing on yeah. you know what 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 another department might do at your university yeah. or whatever. It's purely between you know this tiny part. Of, uh, of your research centre. Otherwise, it, it's, it's invalidated if, yeah. if the commission is not. It, yeah, that's right. The, the, the consortium, and thank you. For, sorry, sorry, the, so, sorry yeah, the terminology is, you're quite right. I was using contract more in the yeah, loose yeah. term. But the consortium agreement will not come into force, it will not have any valid on the IP rights you're doing unless it comes into force. But there are also other agreements. Consortium, there are other agreements, contracts out there which are using the model which are not attached to the funding agreements from the European Commission. So you need to be a little bit, yeah, think about that. And I th thank you very much indeed just for pointing out that, that discrepancy with terminology here. So I'm, my problem is, you know, I'm, I've got a couple of these ones, but I'm more used to the old FT7 and uh, also the, sort of a lot of um, funding agreements from um, other funding agencies. So all of which have slightly different rules. I would actually say that the model consortium agreement for exploitation and commercialization of technology that we're getting been put into place is almost becoming a de facto standard around Europe and probably rightly so. 
Sorry, did you have a question? I was just going to say, what, what date would your consortium agreement come into force? Oh, I don't know what the exact. Um, it comes in, well. So if, you, if you've signed it and then you're waiting for the EC to approve the. Yes. The, the, and, and they do approve it. Is the date that you signed it? Yes, the date that's nominally the date that it comes into force. I, unless you say, I can't remember, some pre, it may say in the preamble, if anybody know what the preamble says, conditional upon the funding agreement. Does it say conditional? You know the agreements yeah, better than I do. Effective date is, yes. You can elect that. You can so make it when everybody signs. Or you can say that it, it comes into force yeah. on the first day of the project, you yeah. know, okay. uh, start date of the project. Yeah. 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 I don't tend to do the funding agreements because that's not my field yeah, of excellence. No, 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 I do the uh, IP agreements. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, one very last question. When you speak of the model of agreements, are you speaking of the disk or are you speaking of the. Uh, I know the Commission has devised a model of their own. Yes. Are you speaking of disk or is it the Commission's own? I've seen both of them and they're both very, very similar. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and I. Yeah. Um, consortium work. Um, I don't think we'll need to go into that in a great deal of detail because I think you, it's um, more, um, that's, I, it's a slide that I often use within a context of um, other people but it's been quite a lot of what's actually been dependent on what's actually you've heard over the past couple of uh, days. Um, Going back to exploitation, we've talked about ownership depending on the employer, also depending on the company concern. And the real issue that I think is going to happen is the fragmented licensing policy from different universities around Europe and even in the world when you're talking about it. That is going to be a real issue because different universities, we've heard it today, are going to have different licensing policies that are going to come out. And sometimes that's governed by local law, sometimes that's governed by internal policy within the university. One of the things, just to give you an idea of something that we've been working on within the one particular project, it's an FP7 project, it's not Horizon 2020, is we actually have set up an exploitation company. Now this is a company, this is a project from FP7 that has got about two or three different um, institutes involved from, two, sorry, several institutes involved from two or three different countries, um, three different countries. And in order to try and get around the issues for the commercialization of the intellectual property that have come out of it, what we are trying to do is the following. We're trying to set up our, what's called an exploitation company and trying to have one company which is going to be either the owner or the exclusive licensee of patents into that company and of license and of the know-how that has come out of this FP7 project. What the folks are also trying to do is they're also trying to get a, um, some f external funding to go into that. Whether that's going to be successful or not, I don't know. This company is going to be set up in Luxembourg. Luxembourg because it has a particularly advantageous structure for IP licensing. There's some issues about one university, whether it can actually license its technology into a Luxembourg company. The reason why we've done this is to basically act as a one-stop shop for the licensing uh, opportunity. Now, Eugene mentioned this morning about how they collaborated and combined um, technology. I think it was, if I remember rightly, which within the gene, was it the gene therapy? They got two stuff together and gave out a large number of licenses with Bering and Mannheim, which is now Rossi agnostic, by the way, for those of you who don't know it. Um, this is what we're actually trying to do here because they th the people concerned, well, there's been several inquiries about licenses, and to try and resolve the issue that the companies might need to get a handful of licenses from different universities with different policies, we actually want to try and achieve this structure um, to have a one-stop shop. So anybody who wants to take a license to this particular technology um, can actually uh, get it um, fairly easily with just signing one license agreement. Um, that is still a work in progress. I, it started at the beginning of this year and um, was just uh, negotiating the licenses from the universities into the company that's been set up so that they can then have the right to sub-license all of the intellectual property that, that comes out. 
Um, the shareholding of the company is currently the, uh, depending on the entity, the research unit and or its associated company um, and possibly some financiers as well. So the partners that are involved will have... The partners that are involved are involved in it and there is a shareholders agreement that's been put in place and revenues are going to be divided according to that shareholders agreement. Do you have a way of deciding how much each partner Yes, yet. <laughs> As I say, there is a, there's a shareholding agreement. Yes, there is a rough agreement of what should happen. You're, but you've, you've hit the nail on the head, you know. The reason why we've done this is basically because it's, it's going to hopefully make a much more efficient licensing model out of the technology, um, rather than having to go to three separate institutions to get three separate licenses. Um, and... Um, to be honest with you, it's a third, third, third to start off with. Um, whether it remains a third, third, third is going to be an interesting question because, as you said, at least one person believes that they might have a higher contribution made to that particular licensing. There's several other licenses that have come out using that sort of thing. Um, some of you may know the story of the, the Frauenhofer MP3 licensing. Fraunhofer, um, I think everybody knows who the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft is, they came up with the um, MP3 codex, what about um, two or three years ago, something like that. No, sorry, 20, or 20 years ago, roughly 20 years ago is it now. They filed patents on it. They, Fraunhofer themselves decided that they weren't in the position to commercially exploit it. They put it into what's now called Technicolor, was at that stage Thompson CSF, which is a French company who had a large operation in Germany, um, gave the license. Thompson, uh, sorry, Technicolor, it's a French company still, then gave it into what's called MPEG LA, which is basically together a one stop licensing body which has combined patents from a large number of universities, companies, um, and to be able to give a one-stop licensing. So anybody who's got, well, we've all, almost all of us, um, except for our dinosaur here, has got a, a telephone that's, uh, you know, uh, plays music. Well, probably your Nokia plays music as well. It's got this MP3 probably on it. All of our smartphones have got the MP3 on it. They've all got licenses from this one-stop shop. And again, the distribution of the proceeds from that was apparently a very, very difficult discussion that was made. I've said, I, have to, I do know what the internal thing says about it. But what it does mean is that anybody who wants to get a license to MP3 from Fraunhofer goes, doesn't go to the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft themselves, goes there, gets licensed not just to the Fraunhofer patents, but also to some other patents out there. The disadvantage about that whole system is that MPEG LA doesn't have all of the intellectual property rights that are necessary. You need to have patents from Microsoft, you need to have patent, uh, sorry, licenses from Philips and licenses from Lucent's Technologies as well to actually be able to get your smartphone doing all of the particular music. But MPEG LA has generally been a very, very successful model. And it's not come up in the Horizon 2020 co co uh, context, but uh, in May of this year, the European Commission actually issued a whole new set of guidelines about these one-stop patent pools, as they're called, how they should be formed, what they should be doing. It's in the context of the technology transfer um, regulations that have been put into it. And certainly, um, I think that um, if the Horizon 2020 does lead to significant amount of licensing that, uh, uh, out of it with various different parties, it's a model that should probably be thought about in other contexts. Mm -hmm. Just to show you how important this is for Germany, I, um, Germany issued a postage stamp a couple of years ago pointing out that Germany was the inventor, as they say, of the gramophone with the big ear. Um, it was also the inventor in, together with of Grundig with the compact, digital compact cassette and now we have the MP3s out there. Um, to, and it's probably it's the most important and most valuable set of patents that are held by the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft with a revenue, I think, of about 100 million euros a year that comes into the licensing organisation of Fraunhofer. 
but is going to be, in 2017 is my recollection, the basic patterns all expire. So Fraunhofer have benefited from that model tremendously over the years. Anyway, I think that is my last slide. If, uh, has anybody got any more questions? No. I'm just I'm wondering whether there are any experiences with setting up an exploitation company in order to collect the IP from a collaborative FP7 or even FP6 project. Because I mean, it's, it's definitely an issue which is raised many times with the IP helpdesk because the partners are working in a collaborative environment and there is background, there is IP, uh, foreground results now, and somebody has to thought out the things to clean up about the IP who is the owner and to develop kind of an exploitation scheme, which could be an exploitation company. And I was in some discussions during the lunch breaks that it's the case for some of the national projects in UK that they got when they lost the permission to set up such companies. But is there an experience in setting up companies? And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering who's going to moderate the process? Yeah. It's definitely not a coordinator. No. Do they appoint a manager, an IP manager, a legal firm? To do that? I, I mean, that, I'm coordinating one of the processes. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned to you in the past that what we're doing there, uh, but actually, at the end of the day, I mean, it's you know, at the end of the day, probably that company is going to require at least uh, one or two full-time professionals just to do the licensing and to monitor the licensing, yeah. even if they sub-license um, yeah. the 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 you know sub sublet or outsource much of the work to the law firm. What we've got is a. I haven't talked about the board of management, which has got representatives. It's also got an advisory board. Um, attached to it, just like the uh, agreements, you know, the agreements that have been put in place. But it's, it's probably, it's only going to be worth it if you're going to have significant sort of funding, uh, sort of uh, expect significant licensing revenue coming in. I mean, the transaction costs on that are going to be to set up the company. We're probably going to be talking about twenty thousand pounds or something like that, um, and then ongoing fees of, well, patent can costs are obviously going to be an ongoing issue. But um, so you, cost. sorry, salary, salary cost, cost, yeah, Re yeah, um, th yeah. That's you know that's all. Are, the, are the, the, the the research partners, whatever the, whoever they were, they're all now kind of pump priming this. They're pump priming this at present, but you know, out of general funds, it's not been particularly. It's, I say twenty thousand to set up the company to start off with, and the idea, what they're looking at or considering is, can we get in external funding to basically pump prime additionally pump prime the licensing process. At the end of the day, we'd love to get one licensee out there who's going to pump prime the rest of the licenses, if I'm honest. And there's a couple of offers going out there, you know, basically along the lines, if you're the first licensee, and we can publicize it, we'll more or less give you a very low license price. Yeah. You know, that's the sort of thing that's going on. Um, the company's based, as I say, based in Luxembourg simply because of um, its, uh, well, it's a low tax. It's not sort of the Amazon, Google model where you know put it into a, a low tax. As I know, it's been criticised in the UK Parliament. There's a very good reason for putting it into Luxembourg, actually, because the multinational company here. It, it's something which I had suggested in a couple of projects. Yeah. Very yeah. similar schemes that didn't get very far with get people to actually understand what I was trying to say mm. uh, and to, to agree with it. And I did want to do it um, under English law. Setting up companies is probably easier than that. But secondly, I also have been able to set up a company using IP from a, a framework project, but not in that sense. It's with a couple of the partners where it sort of come out sideways to that. But that's a structure which I have suggested, but it sort of falls apart in that it either people license the IP exclusively to this new company, so they can get benefit from that by either having I mean, an ownership stake. Or if the IP is then sublicensed, some kind of revenue share back. But then it starts to become legally all for all, and in any other respect, quite a complicated thing to set up. And uh, I sort of lost heart because there was only me trying to do all of that. Yeah. So, it, yeah, so it, you really need everybody to work with you to contribute. I, I mean, I think, you know, there, there, there are practical aspects. Actually, I think the setting it up in the UK probably would work these days, certainly with the patent box exploit, uh, opportunities that are actually open to you. Um, it's just the particular one we've done is Luxembourg, simply because it's, it happens to be convenient for the other partners concerned. 
Um, and I'd be honest with you, there's two people who are really pushing that part of the project, and the third party, fortunately, is going along with the whole of the concept. But it's more or less been um, you know, a silent partner there, not really even pump priming what's going on. One of the problems was that thinking of some one particular project, some of the partners were actually law enforcement agencies who couldn't take a share and couldn't even get any kind of financial benefit. How do you pay if it's a, a police force? Yes. It's not easy to give them money. No, <laughs> it is. I mean, it's, you know, you're. you're <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're it's actually right, you know. But well, you don't know what to do with it, yeah. actually. Well, no, they, they, they gifted in, or you, you, you set up yeah. benevolent, but there are all sorts of ways of... of the, the, I mean, actually, you, you, it's the benevolent fund, believe it or not. There is a, you know, there are ways, for example, of gifting to the police benevolent yeah. fund, I believe, which some things like that. You can actually gift patterns. People don't realise that, but, you know, the, for a while, it was the big thing in America. Off you'd be on Christmas Day. Sorry? <laughs> on Christmas Day. Yes! Really? <laughs> yes. Yeah. But, you know, that's, I mean, you know, doing something like that, there are ways and means of getting around. But your, your point is absolutely right. I mean, it's, you know, there are certain organisations where it is, you know, sometimes they end up with patents for, for various reasons and, you know, they've got really no way of exploiting them. You know, I won't say PC plod or something as, you know, an inventor and, you know, how do you do that? But um, I think they're owned by, you know, the Queen or something like that in those particular instances. But um, you can f often find of ways of doing it. You can't give, the, I, I don't know how you would give the police money, but you could certainly give the Police Benevolence Association some money from that. Brown paper bag, water. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's happened in the past. <laughs> Not for patent work. Anybody? Sorry, uh, brief one. Uh, let's say, <coughs> coming back to included background, mm. let's say that. Party A states in its inclusion list that I bring A, B, C, and D yes. uh, to the project, and the project goes on, and it all of a sudden, you know, he brings in E as well, yes. um, component E, and the the foreground is based on also on. Uh, and at the end of the day, he says that those oh, sorry, I do put put uh, component E in the list. It uh, says A, B, C, D. Yeah. Has have you or has anyone else encountered that situation, and how has it been dealt with? It's usually done by one of the boards, the project, and then mm. it'll be noted in the meetings. So you'll use that as evidence that they did yeah. include it. Yeah, and they should have they should have amended the annex on the consultation agreement that says what's there. And and in, in some ways, if, if they if they failed to notify um, that they were bringing it in and yet allow, had allowed access. And under Belgian law, the fact that they'd given people the code and allowed them, then under Belgian law it would be, of course, they did that deliberately and therefore they, they wouldn't be able to say that they didn't mean it. I'm not sure it's, it's quite that true, is it? I mean, I, I would argue, you could argue two, <coughs> two, in two ways. I seem to remember that the disc says that all the modifications must be made in writing. Sorry, I didn't put uh, E into writing. It's not yours. There is a the, the other one should be is, that, there is no, of course, you brought it in impliedly. Mm -hmm. No, there is a clause within the agreement that specifically states that the executive board can make a decision on additions to Annex A and that background. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. But, but, but so, see, there is no such decision. But there is no decision. such decision. It was only that all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, if it's not decided on the board, and you've, well, yeah, yeah. You've, got, you've got no answer then. If it's just a but, discussion but, but over five minutes. Imagine, minutes. imagine if, he, a he continues the thing, if, if he's brought E, or she's brought E, and she's invented something, she's going to end it anyway. So I don't understand why, I don't know where the issue of E, what, what, what problem is that? No, no, no the, the, the problem is, let's say that this is a Lego tower that you're building, and, and you're bringing E, you're bringing A, B, C, D, and also E, and the tower can't stand without the E component. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one brought in in E says, party A says, uh, no, sorry, I, I've yeah. never stated that on an inclusion list. It's never been dealt on by the General Assembly. There's, there's at least one agreement um, that says along the lines that you acknowledge that this is the complete list. I can't remember with, where that comes from, whether it's a de whether it's desk or, or or the model agreement, but you've actually hit a now, you know, you've hit a real problem because if some people do not honestly declare what background knowledge is, there are issues about it. I don't haven't actually got that uh, seen a problem about it to date, if I'm honest with you. But we may have it coming up in 2020. 
I suggest that we probably make, uh, we probably finish for now because it's getting on. Um, that's my contact to Dino. So I've got that's for my German telephone number. If anybody wants my UK number, then uh, I've got a couple of cards up there with it. Um, but thanks very much indeed for your time today. Thank you, Robert. Um, just taking up the last question about A, B, C, D, E. Uh, don't forget there is a helpline. <laughs> yeah, the help desk. So uh, besides the training, we also have the helpline. Exactly for that kind of questions, and there are there are legal people there. They have a little bit more time, some hours, to consult the issue and to give you an answer on that. So I would like to thank you for your for your patience for your engagement, for asking questions, for the lively discussions I've seen during the coffee breaks. Thank you very much for that. I think we got a lot of feedback, a lot of good comments on it. And of course, you have the opportunity also to complete the feedback forms which we're going to collect then from, from your desk. So thank you very much. In particular, the, the organizer would like, on behalf of the organizer team, I think, uh, also that uh, Eugene Sweeney, who did a lot coordinate the activities. I would like to ask for for of applause also for uh, Claire and Michele who did a lot on logistics and organization. Thank you very much for that. If you'd like to have more training, more training is offered. You can go to our website, we offer training in nice places with nice people. So <laughs> don't don't hesitate so to register for one of the next trainings or for the upcoming trainings in the, in the next years. And if you would like to organize a training in your place, with your organization or in your region, we are always very happy for any suggestions. So we're happy to organize something together with you. And so we are operating European wide, so I'm sure we have an opportunity to come over to you and to bring some experts with us and to organize a training in your place. So thank you very much. Hopefully it was useful and you had good discussions and good time and you have something which you bring into your Horizon 2020 proposals and I cross the fingers that the running proposals will be successful and of course for the next calls and you are fully motivated to write as good and successful proposals. Thank you very much and have a good day.